Fabulous. Okay, so I'm going to get started. Um, I want to thank all of you. Let me just, um, I want to thank all of you for joining me today. Um, um, anyhow, I'm going to close the chat box because I don't want it floating on your screen. So um, after the session, I'm going to go back to the um, your questions and then answer them then. Okay. Thank you all for joining me. This is Kathy Lean with BK Forex, and um, I would like to welcome you to my um, special FX3 session on how to day trade the Forex market. Before I begin, I would like to share with you this disclaimer, which um, basically says that trading Forex carries a high level of risk and may not be suitable for all investors. So um, before deciding to trade any such leveraged product, you should carefully consider your investment objectives, level experience, and risk appetite. Um, if you're watching this video on demand, I encourage you to pause the screen and um, go through the disclaimer as thoroughly as possible so that um, you are aware yourself of the risk involved in FX trading. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, today we're going to talk about day trading on the FX market and, you know, what type of, what type of um, techniques that are being used. We're going to talk about um, four flavors of day trading, um, so different um, tactics that are employed in this market. Then consider which ones are right for you and um, provide you with essential keys to day trading. Now, day trading in the Forex market um, is extremely popular, and, uh, and I think that most people who come to the FX market come to it from the perspective of um, day trading. Now, of course, there are also people who, um, quote, unquote, invest in currencies. But I think that, um, you know, if you take a look at the speculative interest in the FX market, that seems to be um, something that, um, that has contributed, you know, more of the regular volume according to the Bank of International Settlements data they produce, you know, every so often. So why is day trading forex so popular? Well, first of all, um, when you take a look at currency movements in general, on a day-to-day -day basis, on a percentage basis, the moves um, are not really all that large. Um, if you look at the movement of currencies on a given day, usually they'll move half a percent, maybe one percent on a particular volatile day. On a very, very extreme day, we may see currency move, move between 3 to 5%. Whereas in stocks, you can easily see one stock move, you know, 10% in one day, where that is much, you know, more rare in currencies. However, the reason why um, currencies are so um, volatile and considered so dangerous is because of leverage. Now, leverage, you may know, is a double-edged sword where it can compound your profits and also compound your losses. If you just imagine that you use 10 times leverage, a 1% move in currency switch can happen, you know, on a, any given day, uh, it's not all, and it's not all that unusual, would represent a 10% move in the currency. And at that stage, it becomes very significant. And then if you consider the fact that we have those um, extreme days where we may have a 3% move in currencies, 3% times 10 makes us 30%. So that um, shows you how leverage can affect um, the currency movements because people look at this 10 to 30 percent move on just 10 to one leverage, and they see this um, as you know either opportunity or risk. Now you know it certainly goes both ways because your your positions can increase in value by 10 to 30 percent on 10 to one leverage, or decrease in value by 10 to 30 percent, and that is just on 10 to 1 leverage. If you were to employ even greater leverage, 50 to 1, 100 to 1, those intraday moves that, you know, may not seem so large on a cash on cash basis becomes extremely large on a um, levered basis. And so, you know, that, that's why people like to focus on day trading FX because usually brokers offer um, quite a bit of leverage and, you know, we always try to or people that, you know, leverage can be um, extremely risky and lead to losses. Um, but the key here is that because there's so much leverage, the movements on an intraday basis are so significant that people, a lot of people, particularly those of you 
that um, are doing this part time or full time may be um, may be much more keen on day trading currencies than actually you know, swing trading. Because when you swing trading, you do um, intraday trading. Typically, um, that involves having the patience to sit with a position for long periods of time. Another reason why day trading forex is so popular is because the FX market is um, open 24 hours a day. So, because of the assistance of leverage, which can make positions, you know, quite risky to hold overnight, what um, may happen is that what may happen is that we could basically see a situation where currencies um, can move a lot when you're asleep. So that's why some people prefer day trading, because um, when they day trade, um, they can have a much greater control in the position in a sense that they can watch it on a regular basis. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, so the FX market is open 24 hours a day. Many of you are very familiar with this. So the availability to trade at whatever time works for you, either you know after work, in the morning, um, or you know late at night, that, that there's you know generally speaking a market for you to trade. So for people who don't want to carry positions you know overnight while they're sleeping, um, they may opt for day trading because of the, the ability to control the position. So. Typically, day traders, you know, like to concentrate their trading during certain periods of time. We at BK Forex engage in a lot of day trading, and um, a lot of our day trades happen between um, the U.S. and Europe overlap, um, which this is Singapore time. This is for a presentation that I'm going to give in Singapore. But in U.S. time, that's basically 8 a.m. to um, 12 p.m. New York time, and so a lot of our day trading occurs during this time because um, it tends to be the most liquid market out. So depending upon where you are in the world, um, you can kind of gear your day trading to whatever time zone works for you. So who is suited for day trading? People, who, basically, who, the people who are suited for day trading you can see here have um, you know uh, people who are uh, you know, doctors, dentists. And, you know, anyone who has a desk job that is readily accessible to the computer and able to monitor quotes on a regular basis. The reason why, you know, day training is actually very popular among dentists and doctors is because a lot of times, you know, they, um, the, the amount of time they spend with the patient, um, because the results is small, and a lot of times they might, may have a lot of, um, they may have a couple of hours where they're just sitting waiting for patients to come in. So it allows them to go in and out of their offices to check their quotes. It's actually very popular among doctors and dentists. Um, people who have a desk job um, also may be suited for day trading. Of course, this is not, you know, I mean that if you're a doctor and a dentist, you should be day trading or this is the right for you. It's just, you know, my opinion on, you know, how how these are the type of people who who either you know, are their own bosses yeah, or um, are – are um, readily accessible to a computer and therefore, you know, can check quotes and monitor tra their trades on a daily basis. So if you've got a desk job, if you're a doctor, dentist, or someone who basically um, uh, has a lot of downtime um, while you're waiting for something to happen or um, is readily accessible to a computer, then you may want to consider day trading. Who's not suited for day trading? The people who are not suited for day trading are, um, you know, police officers, anybody in the, uh, someone working in an emergency room, typically people who are not able to um, be readily, have a computer, you know, readily accessible. For example, if you're a traffic cop and you're standing in the street at your directed traffic, there, you know, you shouldn't at all be um, day trading, nor can you probably, because you've got to keep your eyes on the road. And same thing with emergency room. Usually emergency room doctors are in the emergency room, you know, during their whole shift period. And they're dealing with fires, they're dealing with, you know, whatever comes up. And, you know, they're not suited for day trading. The picture that you see in, in the middle is, um, is, and as I said, these are slides that I've been seeing from my, Singapore, from my trip to Singapore this week. Um, this is a picture of a hawker stand in Singapore. And basically what hawker stands are is basically little food stands that are very popular in Singapore. And the point I wanted to make, if you're a um, hawker vendor and you're serving food in your little hut, 
which, you know, almost certainly probably doesn't have um, internet connection um, or rarely has internet connection, then you're probably not stupid for day trading either because um, you're not, um, you don't have a computer readily accessible. So when it comes to day trading, it's important to think about um, what type of environments you're in and what type of environment you put yourself in to see whether or not you're suited for day trading. So how to the pros day trade? This is a picture of a um, very traditional um, desk at a bank where you've got um, you know, dealers on one side, salespeople on the other side, and, um, and you know, what happens on an institutional desk is oftentimes clients will call in to the salespeople, and um, once they call in to the salespeople, what they'll do is the salespeople will then um, ask the interbank dealer for a quote. And, on um, you know, let's say you have a client that calls in and says, you know, I want a quote um, on 100 million euros. And they don't necessarily say which direction the quote is in, but they just say, okay, I want a quote on 100 million euros. They call in with this quote, and um, the dealers provide them with a quote, a bid offer spread, and um, the, the, the client deals on it. So what, the row that you just do not see, there's a row of chairs in the back that you do, don't necessarily see. And traditionally, um, in many banks, that row um, are their prop traders. Of course, you know, that's changed in, in the U.S. at least, um, but it can still be true in some cases where there are prop traders, and um, they basically share these flows. So what, how, how did the pro pros day trade? Well, basically what happens is that um, when it comes to the pros, which are basically the bank traders, um, there's a couple different ways that they um, usually look for day trading opportunities. The first one is they piggyback on institutional client flow. So if you imagine that a client um, gives, uh, you know, the client calls in, they ask the salesperson for a quote on 100 million euros. The salesperson gives them a quote, let's say um, 132.25, and then the um, client says, okay, I want to sell. So they sold at 132.25, and they've basically um, given the bank or the, the dealer 100 million euros at 132.25. So what that means is that the dealer is then long 100 million euros at 132.25. So they've got a quote-unquote day trade and manage the institutional client flow, which um, is a technique that a lot of bank traders use. Not as a technique, but I would say is um, – is the job of the, of the bank trader, which is to day trade the in and out of their position. Another popular technique used by bank traders is trading for the next pip. Now, and this is actually true of um, not only pros who may be bank dealers, but also a lot of hedge funds. You may have heard of the term algorithmic trading um, or robot trading. What these algorithmic robot traders do is um, they're basically, you know, trading for a quarter of pip, um, a pip. They've got these all these fancy um, algorithms to basically um, uh, uh, stay in it, go in and out of position for a very short period of time. And uh, it could be microseconds, it could be um, one second, but usually these um, algorithms are trading for the next pip and um, not much more beyond that. Another popular day trading technique that bank traders use is um, to trade new highs, new lows. Now, number one and number two, um, as retail or individual traders, we are not able to really do um, effectively because, A, we're usually – we're not dealers. We're not given client flow, and we're not exposed um, to client flow. And, two, you know, unless you're super smart um, – and you are, a, you know, a very savvy programmer with a lot of access to pricing. Um, you're probably not um, fat. You're prob your servers are probably not fast enough, um, or your programs are not intelligent enough to trade for the next step. And I will be the first to say that I am one of those people where, you know, um, we we're not smart enough, fast enough, um, and you know, do enough um, flow in the markets to be able to create these algorithms that just trade for a micro pip or for a pip. So instead, one the only tactic that that really leaves us with as individuals and creators to trade 
is to trade new highs, new lows. And um, we'll talk more about that, and we'll um, talk about how to do that in just a little bit. But I want to say that um, there are four flavors of day trading um, that, or there's just basically four types of day trading strategies out there. And I feel that, you know, almost um, every strategy that you consider falls into one of these buckets. The first one is trading short-term um, reversals. The second one um, is trading a quick breakout. The third one is basically joining a new an, or existing trend. And the fourth um, flavor of day trading is the trade moves. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at each of these individually. Um, starting off with the round number scalp. Now, in terms of the round number scalp, what that basically involves is, you know, first of all, a round number is um, is, is it's a situation where the last two digits of the currency pair is um, zero, zero. And the whole thesis behind the round number scalp is that oftentimes the test of the round number, the first test of the round number is a failed one. And, um, and the reason why that occurs is because the round numbers are significant levels. And so as a result, um, oftentimes when the currency pair, you know, touches the round number for the first time, they could be some hesitation and resistance at that point. And that hesitation and resistance can be a trading opportunity. Now, of course, you know, that doesn't happen all of the time, um, but I think, you know, it happens, in my opinion, um, enough of the time for there to be some opportunity. So I'm actually going to go to a chart. And you, I want you to excuse my um, my lines and my charts. I'm actually going to delete them because I had these up earlier for another webinar. All right, so we're going to look at a five minute chart here of the euro dollar, and um, the round number that we tested in the euro dollar was 132 this morning. So what you may notice is that um, there's a couple things that occurred at the 132 break in the euro dollar. So let's start off in the beginning of the day, where the euro was rallying from 8 a.m. to about um, 10 a.m. And of course, 10 a.m. is when we had the um, existing home sales report being released. So rally, 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 about 10 minutes before the existing home sales report, the euro dollar hit 132 and fell back. Now, when it comes to the round number scalp, what we're doing um, is you want to look for the first test of 132. And this is scalp. So, therefore, um, it is something that, you know, you have um, that, you know, we're basically looking for a very brief move in the currency pair. So, the way the round number scalp is, is that um, when the currency pair hits the round number for the first time, um, you fade the scalp, which is why the first we'll, – we'll be looking to fade the scalp, which is why – the first flavor of day trading is to trade for term reversal. So at 132, and you can even put a resting order out there, at 132, you can put an order to sell um, the euro dollar at 132 with a 10 pip target and 10 pip stop. And of course, you know, trading for us, here's a high level of risk can be not be suitable for all investors. That's important to remember. And, um, you know, stop to sudden slippage by your broker. What you'll see is in the candle afterwards, um, if you had a 10 pip profit, you can see that the currency pair got to low of 131.89, and so it did um, achieve that 10 pip profit. Another flavor of this uh, scalp is um, if you're not comfortable with um, such, such narrow stops and limits, um, something to consider maybe a 20 pip stop, 20 pip target. But uh, sorry, a 20 pip stop would be a 15 pip target, which is slightly negative risk reward. But once again, you're looking to fade a short term move, not a longer term move. But I prefer, in my opinion, the 10 pip profit, 10 pip um, stop for a scalp. Now let's take a look at um, some other examples. Now the euro dollar has been range trading lately, so there's not too much um, examples here. 
So you can see here, this is the first test of um, 131. Actually, no, this is not the first test. The first test of 131 is over here. So for that day, the first test of 131 is over here. So basically, um, the cursor sells off to 131. Um, with the round number scalp, you would go along 131, stop 10 pips below 13090, target 10 pips above, and you can see that the currency pair rallies and then ends up hitting a target. Of course, if it didn't happen, it would, um, and it didn't hit the target and it reversed, it would have stopped you out at 13090. And the same is true of the other example. If it did not, um, if it did not, if it did not hit the, um, I think the other example we're looking at over here. If it did not retrace the 10 pips and it powered higher, which can happen, especially if this happens on the back of news, which is why you may not want to um, trade this on the back of news, because when it happens in the back of news, it's probably happening because of, you know, a quote-unquote key piece of data that it could stop you out, and that's why stops are very, very important. I want to look at one more example. Remember, this is the first test of, even though this is a, seems like it's a good trade, what we would be looking for is looking for the first test of 131, and this is the second test. So, you know, it could have, um, it did in this case, you know, be a, be a good trade, but it could have just as easily stopped you out. So the key is you want to create the, the first test, because by the time you test it the second time, that means that, you know, people are getting, you know, we're bearish it again. And the only reason why your dollar didn't break it the second time um, is because we had um, weak U.S. existing, we had, um, you know, some sell-off in the U.S. dollar drove the euro dollar higher. But um, it could have just as easily stopped you out, which is why you want to do the first test. Anyway, um, let's keep going. So here's an example where the currency pair is below 131, and it tests 131, um, and let's say you basically, in this case, this is not the first test. It's us look for the first test. Better to probably start at the beginning of the day. All right, so this is the beginning of the day, and this is 131. So you see a lot of consolidation. It tests 131, and let's say you sold at 131, 10 pips above, and the low here was 88, 10 pips below, and um, that would have hit your profit target. But in this case, you know, there's a lot of consolidation at 131. It started the day off at 131 as well. So I'd be a little weary of taking this trade because it's not as if we came from a much higher level or a much lower level. And then we're testing 131 first time. This one is pretty, pretty, pretty much, you know, just oscillating around that level. So while it was a profitable trade, you know, this one could have stopped you out just easily just because of random oscillations. You want to look for something that is more like, um, more like this where it has fallen significantly, um, and significant is, you know, up for, for judgment, but in this case, I think 30 pips um, is a relatively good move. So it's fallen by 30 pips, it's rebounding again, testing 131, and you see the failure at the 131 level um, on this chart. The second time it did it, um, that's when it bursted higher, which is why, you know, you want to trade the first test and not the second test, or you want to fade the first test and not the second test. Because the second test, um, will all, you know, can, um, you know, can end up being a real break of the figure level. So in this case, it did fail at the 131 level. And in the second case, if you shorted this here at 131, um, that would be a fail trade, but that's not something that you would want to do. So that's basically what the round number scale looks like. Um, the second flavor of day trading is the trade breakouts. So, why bother with breakouts if prices range trade, you know, 70% of the time you see that, approximately 70% of the time where you see there's a lot more consolidation in a currency pair than um, breakout moves. Or, I mean, breakout moves are what you notice more often in a currency pair because that's when you see the really extended um, and massive moves in the currency pair. But most of the time on an intraday basis, as well as on a day-to-day -day basis, currency can spend a lot of time in ranges. So the reason why people bother with breakouts at all is because breakouts can lead to massive moves. And breakouts can be readily identified on a chart. Um, so what a lot of people traders find is that um, because currencies range trade um, pretty often, they're able to isolate the range in the currency pair 
and determine the key levels um, that would represent a breakout in the pair. Breakouts are an um, integral part of um, Sorry, um, breakouts are an integral part of speculative markets, and breakouts are an integral part of speculative markets, and um, are something that you know a lot of um, investors and traders obsess over. Because when a breakout occurs, it's kind of like when we were in dollar yen and we were getting to the 100 level, didn't quite get there. Everyone was obsessing about whether or not we'd actually break 100. So breakouts are an integral part of speculative markets because when a currency pair moves and when a breakout, especially when a breakout occurs on the back of a fundamental change, that that could lead to um, a, very, a much more massive move in the currency pair. So what is a breakout? Um, a breakout is um, kind of like this guy, you know, basically trying to um, – actually, no. A breakout is not breaking out of jail. It's basically breaking out um, of – clear prior ranges. So when it comes to breakout trading, um, you want to look for a clear break of a prior range, higher range low. And there are two primary drivers of breakouts. Now, of course, these are not the only drivers because um, sometimes you'll just see sitting happy and terms of our range trading and suddenly you'll break out for no reason. That can happen um, when uh, we are near market opens and our market closes. A lot of times in the last half hour of trading in the North American session, you may see um, a breakout. But on a day-to-day -day basis, there are two primary drivers of breakout. One is news, and the second is price. And this is an example of um, a news-driven breakout, where, um, where what you see is prior to – this is um, right around the um, ECB rate decision – and you see that um, the currency pair, the low previous to that was 130.50. So the currency pair had been consolidating around 130.50. And when um, Draghi said that he would consider negative rates, that um, caused a breakdown in the euro dollar. And it caused it to break below a low that had basically limited the sell off in the currency pair for about, I would say, 15 days. So pretty much from April 25th all the way up to about April 7 or 8, um, the euro dollar had been um, holding above 130.50. And when Draghi came out and he said that the ECB considered negative rates, which is a pretty big deal, that's when um, we saw the currency pair break down. Because news moves markets, and it's important to realize that um, you know, while what he says may not always move markets, when it's significant enough, it, like in this case, this drive considers negative rates, it can cause quite a bit of sell off in the um, in the euro dollar. Here's a, a, an example of a price breakout, the one that we had just been talking about earlier, where dollar yen um, for you know over a one month period had been attempting to test the 100 level, but failed to do so, um, and you know, everyone had been watching this level for quite some time. And when it broke the 100 level, it ripped higher. You can see on um, this is a four-hour chart. So um, on the four-hour candle of the 100 break, it, um, it, it, it moved already significantly. And hours that followed, the break um, extended, um, continued to extend. So sometimes you have a news break, but sometimes you can have a price break. Price break, um, you know, the reason why price breaks is, are interesting is because um, if the level is significant enough, oftentimes um, there will be a lot of orders um, sitting at the level, either stop orders, take profit orders. And the reason for that is because, you know, we're human beings. We like to think around at, um, in round numbers. Um, the same is true of, um, you know, major um, funds that um, may have um, positions out there or exporters or companies who are saying, okay, if it gets above 100, that's what I want to hedge. So a lot of um, players in the market think in terms of round numbers. And so when we have a price break um, of a key level, especially when it's attempted to test it a few times and um, failed uh, to really extend beyond it, that that can lead to um, a pretty big move um, in the currency 
um, that follows. Now, not always, especially when we have like a 99 break or 98 break, it may not be as interesting. Um, you only see this more when we have a really big significant round number break, um, in my opinion. Um, this is another example of um, a round number break where we had a round number break in the beginning, and then um, when it went, when it, so it spent some time, it spent like a month or so above 100, and then it started to reverse lower, broke back to low 100. And you can see here the first break below 100, depending upon what your gauge of significance is, the first break was a failed one because it only went um, 99 pips. And it wasn't until the second break, um, second time that it broke lower, that it really started to fall and fell all the way down to 95. So uh, depending upon how you position here, you know, if you position the first break and it was a bigger move, you would have been stopped out. If you waited for the second move, it would have been a much um, um, larger trade. So that's an example of um, how breakouts occur. So the next question is, you know, how do we take advantage um, of some of these breakouts? Well, one um, technique to consider is one is the one percent new high new lows um, uh, uh, strategy that um, we started with this, our presentation with, where I said that um, looking at the break of one percent new highs and new lows is something that a lot of um, um, interbank traders, you know, from my experience working at JP Morgan, um, have traded. So what does it mean to trade 1% new highs and new lows? Basically, um, what you're looking for is, and this is not something that needs to be coded because this is something that is more um, visual than anything else and more of an art than a science. So what we're talking about here is, sorry, I just need to take a sip of water. What we're talking about here is you want to identify um, a significant low in the currency pair. So like a multi-month low, for example. So in this case, um, we see that um, there's a multi-month low in the euro dollar at around 126.25. And then what you want to do is you want to see the currency pair break the multi-month um, higher low by 1%. Because when it breaks the multi-month higher low by 1%, that's when, um, you know, a 1% move is generally considered a significant break. So in this case, where my arrow is pointing, it says that we have a break of a four-month low by 1%. And that's when you want um, to consider taking the trade. And because a lot of what a lot of um, professional traders do is that once they see a 1% break, the next day um, they, or, you know, at the close of the market, they may basically uh, position for a continuation trade. And, um this continuation trade can be a short-term trade. It could be a, um, quote, unquote, swing trade. In this case, if you um, took a short-term trade and um, you basically sold the euro dollar after the 1% move, um, and let's say you went for 25 pips or so, which is something I think would be reasonable for a short-term trade, you can see that um, in the uh, data followed that it did move lower by another 25 pips, but there was a lot of volatility, and you know it's probably a 100 pip range. With these 1% um, breaks, what um, I would prefer to do is to hold this for more of a swing trade than anything else, because as you can see from this chart, um, there was a little bit of consolidation, but it did continue lower by another uh, 300 pips or so. Um, here's another example. When we have a, a three-month break, we had a break of the, of the three-month high in the euro dollar. It was a 1% break of the three-month high. So um, as a day trader, you may go long after the 1% break. If you did do that, you would stop that the next day because um, depending on how wide your stop is. Um, if your stop was about 25 pips, you probably would have been stopped out. If your stop was wider, which of course means that you're taking more risk and you may have been able to hold the position. With the we, with these one percent breaks, um, once again, it may be better to hold to look at it from more of a swing trading perspective, where you see that the currency fair has one percent break, you go long, and then you put a stop, you know, maybe a hundred pips um, lower, targeting a um, hundred pips as your first target, and then selling the stop for the main, remainder of the position. And that's what I would do. Of course, you know. Um, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future results, just because it's, this is the way it's shown you in the chart does not mean that this is the way 
that it could, um, you know, go moving forward as well. Um, break the four-month highs. So just another example where, um, in this case, we have consolidation in the currency pair. It breaks the four-month high by more than 1%, which is the first green candle. In this case, both the day trade and the swing trade um, would have um, taken you into a much bigger move. And the point I always want to make is that when you have a consolidation and then you have a clear break of the range of consolidation by 1%, that's when you want to look for trading opportunities on both the day trading and swing trading basis. Because, I mean, yes, um, we saw some examples of um, us being stopped out, um, but this is an example of it moving um, in, in in the desired direction for both the day trade and the swing trade. Of course, past performance is not indicative of future results, and trading for carries risk. And, you know, that risk is shown here, which is that the Aussie dollar here, you should see that we had a not long period of consolidation. And if you treated this October break, um, which is a break of a five-month low, it would have been a failed break in the currency pair. Even if you treated the break from this low here, it would have also been a failed break because it doesn't always um, work out. And one of the key signals of perhaps why this one did not work out is that we had a long wick on the bottom followed by a um, small candle on top, which is a reversal candle. So maybe you saw that. You saw that we had a 1% move. Maybe you wouldn't have taken the trade. But um, if you did take the trade, it was obviously a failed trade. General rule of breakouts, the longer the break, sorry, the longer the base, the bigger the potential breakout. Of course, this doesn't always happen, but um, what it does tell you is that the longer the base that you have, the longer the period of consolidation between a level, the more significant those levels become, and the greater the likelihood um, traders are to put their stops and limits, and the hedgers are also, to put their stops and limits around those levels. And so, therefore, in those cases, when you see that, um, there's a good chance that when we have a break, it could be a very significant one. So, and this is an example of that, where we have a two-and-a-half-year base in dollar-yen, and when the currency pair finally breaks out, um, it becomes a very big breakout. Of course, past performance is not indicative of the result, and trading forex carries risk. And the um, next technique that um, the third way of day trading is to join a new trend. Some of you may be familiar with um, the double Bollinger Band, which is um, a technical indicator that I like to use quite a bit. Um, I did list it here, but the settings of the Bollinger Bands um, that I use is 20 period, two standard deviations, and 20 period, one standard deviation. Um, and so when it comes to joining a new trend, um, I think there's that, you know, that when we look to join a new trend, the opportunity is more of a day trading opportunity that could turn into swing trading opportunity, but so the case in point, the first opportunity is a day trading opportunity. So what you want to look for when it comes to joining a new trend is you want to look for the currency pair to close above the first standard deviation from Bollinger Band. So here we've got some, um, we've got a chart, and the lines of these charts are Bollinger Band. The outside lines are the second standard deviation Bollinger Band, and the inside lines are the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. And so what we're looking for here is we're looking for um, the currency pair to close above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. So all the arrows point here is the close above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. So with the first arrow, you see that the current spread dipped below. It previously be been into the, in the one, two bands on the upside. Then it dipped below the one, two band. And then it rose back above it and it closed above the one, two band. So that's the first thing you want to look for. So these arrows simply point to the, uh, the, the first setup, which is the first step. You want to look for the current spread close above the first standard deviation bull in the band. Then what you want to do is you want to go long at the next candle. So the first arrow is when the current spread closes above the first standard deviation bull in the band. The second candle um, is where you want to go long. So you basically want to go long um, at the second candle. Remember, trading for our carries risk. So you go long at the second candle. So um, you know, take a moment to, to take a look at um, the places where you would go long. The second example, um, the uh, arrow should be nudged a little bit lower. I wonder if I can um, 
trying to annotate here. So this is the candle that, oops, sorry. Um, so this is the candle that closed above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. And this This is the candle where you want to go long. So just let's take a look down these charts. You can see the other ones are um, pretty self-explanatory. Then what you want to do is you want to put your stop 15 book pips below the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. And um, generally speaking, um, you want to risk no more than 30 pips. Of course, stops can be because you know stops can be subject to slippage by your broker. And your um, first target is the amount risk, so generally about 30 pips. And then when your first target is hit, you can trail your stop in the remainder of the position um, and move it upwards as you see fit. So let's go back to the example and see how um, these would have worked out. So you see here, you go along here, and the next, sorry, you, the first candle is when it basically um, closes above the first standard deviation movement. You go along with the next candle. And then you see there's period consolidation, which um, uh, which doesn't stop you out because our stop, remember, is um, our stop is 15 pips below the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. Um, Sorry, I'm distracted by text, but um, so your stop is there. So you'll see that it doesn't stop you out and it moves higher. Um, in the next example, in this case, we see that the currency pair drops below the um, first standard deviation Bollinger Band. Now, this one, um, you could have, it would have gone long here and it wouldn't have stopped you out because it basically dropped back below the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. In this case, you go along at this candle here, and your um, T1 then hit the next candle. Uh, this one, you would have been stopped out, but the thing is that because it opened pretty much at the first standard deviation bullion demand, you may or may not have taken this trade. This next one, you would have gone long here. T1 hit the next candle. Gone long. This is an example. You gone long here, and this one you would have been stopped out. Here you would have gone long, and then T1 would have been it. Sorry, you go long at the at uh, this candle, and then T1 it would have been hit at this move here. So you can see that there are cases when um, you know there's a good trade. There are cases when you get stopped out. When it is a good trade, um, there is an opportunity to trail your stop for a bigger move um, afterwards. All right, let's move on to um, the last um, example, the last technique that I want to show you because we're running out of time. is reactive news trading. With reactive news trading, that's basically um, so the fourth flavor of um, flow is to um, basically trade news. And um, that opportunity is basically to trade news reactively. Now, um, trading news can be risky because there could be big moves. Um, these are two ways that um, you can, you know, kind of uh, consider when you consider news trading. The first one is you want to wait. Is uh, The first technique is to wait five minutes. The second technique is to wait for the candle break. With news trading, news trading requires swiftness. Um, the first thing you want to look for is you want to wait – in, in uh, the first way technique is you want to wait for technical confirmation on a five-minute chart. So this is an example. In this case, we have Australian PMI numbers scheduled for release. The number is stronger. So we're looking for um, technical confirmation. What that means is that if the number is good, we want for um, the candle to close green, five-minute candle to close green. If the number is bad, we want to look for the five-minute candle to close red. Then we um, want to have a 20-pip stop, 20-pip first target, um, and, you know, in this example here, um, you see that the number comes out good. 
the Aussie dollar closes green. So you want to go long at 91.45, the stop at 91.25, and a target of 9165. And you can see here the um, currency pair, the currency pair um, basically, sorry, one second. Um, the currency pair um, basically consolidates and then hits um, your profit target about an hour later. Here's another example. In this example, we have Q1 GDP from the U.S. U.S. GDP is weaker. It comes out 1.8% versus 2.4% expected. Dollar yen sells off. Candle is red. So then you want to go short at 97.44 um, and stop at 97.64, 20 pips higher, target of 97.24. So you do see that um, some, oftentimes, you know, in the after initial news release, there's some consolidation. This one actually gets all the way up to 60, and if it went to 64, it would have stopped us out. Um, but it didn't, and it then um, uh, fell and hit a profit target um, about an hour and a half later at 97.24. And whenever I um, show examples, I like to show winners and losers to give you a reality check. In this case, um, we had a news release in Australia. Data was negative. Candle closed red. So you would have gotten short at 91.57, sorry, 91.37. Stop at 91.57. And um, you can see here in this case, um, it did stop us out. So sometimes it will happen, which is why it's important to have a stop. The second flavor of um, news trading is to wait for the news candle break. So the first thing you want to do is you want to wait for the five minute candle to close as well. Um, and that becomes the news candle. And then what you want to do is you want to wait for the break of a high or low of the five minute candle. With a 20 pip stop, 20 pip first target. Remember, trading forex is high level risk and not suitable for all investors and stops are subject, subject, subject by broker. This is what you're looking for. These are the same examples that we were, or some of the same examples that we're looking at. So the Aussie PMI report. So in this case, you see that um, the first five minute candle closed green, and that, that becomes the news candle. So what we're looking for is we're looking for a break of the five minute candle. So um, in order to go long at 91.50, which is a which is um, the high of that candle. So we go along um, about 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, about 25 or so minutes later. We go along the 91.50, stop at 91.30, and then a target 20 pips above at 91.70. So in this case, um, it did start to move lower. If it hit 30, it would have stopped us out. Um, came close to it, didn't. Uh, moves upwards, and then hit a profit target of 91.70. Here's an example of CAD GDP. CAD GDP came out weaker. Um, and this is kind of interesting because the news candle actually was red. So um, if we were doing the uh, the first technique, we would not have gotten um, long dollar cash because the news candle was red. So um, because, you know, the data was before the news candle could have been green if the market believed the data was going to be weak. So, but so it was red. If you waited for um, the five-minute news candle break, then – what you would have done instead is you would have gone long at the high of this candle, which would have um, been 5, 10, 15, 20, 20, 25, about 30 minutes later. Um, you've gone long at the high of the candle at uh, 101, sorry, 105.13, um, so 104.93 with the target of 105.13 stop at 104.73. And, um, and this is an example of that happening. And Here's an example of, um, here's a failed example where in this case we obviously had very strong CAD employment numbers. So we had very strong CAD employment, sorry, we had very weak CAD employment numbers, which is why Dolly CAD stored. So if we were trading the five minute news candle break, the next candle, um, we go long at 106, um, and pretty much gets hit at the next candle, but then it reverses and stops us out. And sometimes that happens, especially with Canadian data which uh, oftentimes Canadian data is released at the same time as U.S. data, and Canadian employment is oftentimes released at the same time as non-farm payrolls. So um, the market may um, not care so much about the CAD data. So in this case, if you did um, the five-minute news break, you would have stopped out, which is why we use stocks. But, you know, of course, stocks can also be subject to slip All right, so basically, um, what to trade, when to trade for day trading. Um, if you are an evening trader, these are in Eastern time. So if you're an evening trader and you trade between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. East Coast time, then and you um, are interested in news trading, then uh, 
says you want, you just want to consider is August, meaning yen, because those are the time frames when we have Australian, New Zealand, Japanese, and Chinese data scheduled for release. If you're a European trader and you like to trade between 2 to 5 a.m. East Coast time, then maybe you want to consider the euros, the pound, and the Swiss franc, uh, and, because that's when we get eurozone data, UK data, and some London trade opportunities. If you're a day trader, this should as we say 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. I apologize for this. Actually, I'm going to show that right now. So if you're a daytime trader, 7 a.m. to 12 p.m., you can trade anything um, because um, we have uh, U.S. data scheduled for release, Canadian data scheduled for release, and that can affect all of the major currency pairs. Um, but, of course, remember, new strain can be um, needs, requires swiftness um, and uh, can be relatively risky. So the question now is um, what type of day trading style is right for you? Um, and this is where you should consider your, your lifestyle and consider what type of hours you're up during the day um, to basically help you determine, um, you know, which trade, what day trading style would be right for you. Maybe um, you're not um, available to watch your screens during the day and you may only want to consider breaks of new highs and new lows. Or you maybe want to only consider doing a new trend where you only need to check it um, at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time every single day. So um, day trading, there's many flavors of day trading, and not every flavor will be um, suitable for everyone, so it's important to be aware of which ones are right for you. So quickly, I want to end with the five keys of Forex day trading. Always use a stop, even if the stops are subject to submission by broker, because you don't want to be in a position where you feel like this woman here. Be aware of data releases, because that could either be a trading opportunity or throw off some of your breakout trades. Be nimble with day trading. Um, you want to um, get in and out of your positions. Don't be too greedy. Be adequately capitalized, um, which is true for all trading, so don't over lever. And control your risk um, because, you know, that's the key to be able to survive each day trade another day. Day trading is all we do at BK4X. We have a day trading strategy. If you haven't downloaded it already, I encourage you to download it at BK4X.com forward slash euro dollar, U-R, U-S-D. Um, and just quickly, what we offer at BK4X is we offer um, we have every single day we send our clients a daily trading plan with orders to put into the system. Now, remember, trading forex carries a high level of risk um, and can be risky. We also provide trading signals uh, on a regular basis, trading education. And now we offer a trade copier, um, which is kind of, you know, copy trader for some of our day trading signals. So please um, consider that. If you have questions about it, feel free to email us. This is just an example of some of the things that we do. We have a webinar every single day. Um, and we um, have various information that we provide to our clients. So uh, I encourage you to download our free trading strategy and then also to visit our website, bkforums.com. Now let's open the floor up to any questions that you may have. So I'm going back to some of the questions that we have earlier. Uh, closing trades before the end of the day. Um, I'm not too sure what the question is about, but is day trading limited by actual trading time? Well, day trading is um, – a lot of traders like to limit their day, day trading to a specific trading time so that they're being able to watch it and monitor it. But, of course, you know, if your full-time trader is not limited to any specific time, especially if you're willing to wake up in the middle of the day. And um, for those of you that uh, do you have – um, jobs that keep you away from the cool computer, of course, you can always check your mobile, and there's lots of different ways that alerts that continue when certain price levels are reached. Is there a floor for algorithms for fractional picks? Um, these computer systems um, have gotten very sophisticated, and so um, there's many different ways that they can um, you know, slice and splice prices, um, much more sophisticated than um, – that I have knowledge of, of, but I do know that they go to fractional pips. How many lots may be used for scalp? That's really based upon your own risk profile. How many pips to target while day trading? In my opinion, with day trading, I like to target between um, 8 to 30 pips. What time frame is good for day trading? Um, as a lot of our examples are on five-minute charts. But that doesn't mean that it's the best time frame with, um, for day trading. We just use five-minute charts to help us illustrate the prices. 
Um, it's really sometimes about news and price. Do you use um, indicators to help confirm day trading? Um, it would certainly help if you did. It's something to definitely that you may want to consider. And then um, do day traders close day at the end of the to close their trades at the end of the day? Um, most day traders, um, in my experience, do close their trades at the end of the day. We close our trades, um, you know, our breakout trades at the end of the day as well. Any additional questions? Day trading can be more stressful, um, but it really depends how you look at it because um, being able to monitor it and not have it um, – being able to monitor trade can also give you a level of control, which some people like as well. It's really based on your own personality. Any additional questions? Am I a patient person? Not very. At what age can you start day trading? I mean, I think it's basically whatever age they let you open up an account. So if there are no additional questions, I want to thank you all for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed the session. And as I said, I encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to please um, – uh, to, to download the strategy if you would like, um, it's a day trading strategy for the euro dollar.